Growing up, my mother told me a story about an aswang or witch in the Philippines. Aswangs are known to live in rural areas and have the ability to appear like any other human being. At night, they shift into predators and stalk their prey. They hunt for human flesh and their preference is children. My family can be quite superstitious, so my mom told me this story not to scare me but as a warning for me to not trust strangers so easily and so that I wouldn't go to sleepovers. This Aswang lived in a provincial village near the mountains. He had a daughter who he loved very much. However, he had a secret he kept hidden from her. He was a monster. He gave his daughter a pair of earrings as protection from him. She was mortal and was raised like any other young girl. One day, his daughter came home from school and asked him for permission to allow her friend to sleep over at their place later that week. He agreed, but told her that she had to keep her earrings on. He was looking forward to it. The day finally arrived. The friend came over after school and they had a fun-filled evening. The Aswan made sure he fed them both really well. After dinner, they went to the girl's bedroom and played games. The friend saw the daughter wearing the earrings and admired them. She asked if she could borrow them and the daughter agreed. She told her to make sure she gave them back before they fell asleep. After playing with their dolls, they fell asleep and she forgot to return the earrings. During the night, the Aswan came into their room. It was pitch black and he trusted that his daughter obeyed his command and kept the earrings on. He quietly checked each girl and knew that the girl without the earrings would be the guest. So, without hesitation, he began to eat her. The plan was to make it look like she left in the middle of the night because of an emergency at home. He enjoyed his feast, especially since it had been a while since he had fresh meat. When the sun began to rise, he realized that he made a terrible mistake and had actually eaten his daughter. He looked over to the other girl and saw the friend was still asleep and wearing the earrings. It was too late. He was full of outrage and devastation. He didn't know what to do and was disgusted and disappointed at himself. The friend heard his crying and woke up. She saw what had happened and let out a scream. The Aswang looked at her, eyes full of tears and blood stained on his face. In a split second, he got up and grabbed the friend. Luckily, she was still wearing the earrings so he couldn't hurt her. She managed to escape and ran outside yelling for help. All the townspeople heard what happened, gathered up some weapons, and stormed into the Aswang's home. The Aswang was still in his daughter's room, holding what was left of her body and sobbing. Everyone started beating him and tied him up. Word soon reached the whole village as punishment. The Aswang was to be executed that day, but beforehand had to walk around the village with a sign that read, I am a witch who ate his daughter. Following the execution, it was said that sometimes at night, villagers could see the Aswang standing on the rooftop of the homes of those with children. My family and I would spend summers in the Hamptons. No, it wasn't because we were rich or anything like that. We did, however, have a family friend who was a millionaire. Unfortunately, she was a widow and lived alone. The mansion we stayed at cost about $7 million. It was in a very secluded area. I remember being shocked when I could actually see the stars and hear the crickets at night. We lived in the city, so it took about three hours to get there by car. I remember being really excited to see the place where all the rich city folks spent their summers. As soon as I entered the mansion, I felt a weird energy in the air but didn't say anything about it. There were more than 10 bedrooms. The place was massive. I think the creepiest part about it was just how vacant it was. There were also expensive paintings on the walls and smaller portraits in some of the bedrooms. I remember thinking this was weird. We were given a house tour, and my brother, my friend Kat, and I stayed on the third floor, which was pretty much the attic. One night, everyone was hanging out on the third floor. We turned on the television, pulled out Monopoly from the shelf, and started setting up the game. We had just started playing the game when suddenly, all the lights went off. Quickly, we all tried to find each other and held on to one another for dear life. My dad told us all to form a line, and my dad tried to lead us outside. I was scared. What if we saw or felt something out of the ordinary? We kept bumping into furniture and walls. I feared going down the stairs. 
Thank goodness my friend spoke up and said that she would take the lead. Her memory saved us because she had memorized the layout of the place. We made it outside safely and all we saw when we stepped outside were the stars. Once we were outside, the lights came back on. We had no idea what caused the sudden blackout. In another situation, we were all hanging around the pool. My brother and I were playing Marco Polo. I'm a pretty decent swimmer, but when I got to the other end of the pool, I felt like something was pulling me in, so my dad had to come to the rescue. I didn't tell anyone what I felt. In another instance, a few family friends joined us for a couple of days. Some of us were hanging out in one of the bedrooms. I was sitting on the bed, minding my own business, when I suddenly fell off. It caught me off guard, but I never told anyone that it felt like someone had pushed me. The family friend who stayed in that bedroom was also locked inside the bathroom. The odd part about this was that everyone was hanging out at the pool which was right outside of the bathroom's window. She was screaming and banging on the window for help, but no one heard her. She ended up escaping through that window. She said that when she was locked inside the bathroom, the window wouldn't open and she heard movement in the bedroom. Later, when we told the owner of the house what happened, she apologized and told us that that bedroom was a known spot for paranormal activity. The owner also told us that many years ago, one of the women who lived in the house drowned in the pool. She told us that the bedroom our friend got locked inside was her bedroom and said that the portrait on the wall was of her. After hearing this, we were all freaked out, so we decided that we would never return to that mansion. I think it's safe to say that we were unwelcome guests. When I was younger, my mom told me the story of her relative's possession. This happened in the Philippines, and my mother witnessed this in person. This woman was a cousin from my lolo or grandfather's side of the family. My mom wasn't close to her, but my lolo insisted that she help out during her possession. She was experiencing toothaches, and during this time, seeing a doctor was very expensive. So, out of desperation, she settled for a visiting faith healer who gave her herbal medicine that she concocted herself. She was instructed to take it after her meals. For those who are unaware of the practice of faith healers, they are religious, Christian healers who use the power of prayer to evoke divine intervention in the physical or spiritual healing of those who are sick. She followed the faith healer's instructions and took a pill that night. Shortly after, she got really sick. No one could explain it, but after seeing the faith healer, she changed and something otherworldly took over her body and soul. She was possessed by something full of malice. She would curse and say very hurtful things to her family members. Her children were scared to go near her. She tried to go back to the faith healer, and everyone in town tried to locate her, but she was long gone. Everyone knew that the faith healer wasn't working under light and Christian faith, but out of darkness and the devil. They were going to accuse her of being a witch. Everyone knew that she was cursed and told her to get rid of the pills, but it was too late. She was no longer herself. She spoke in tongues and would scratch the walls. They had to tie her up to her bed and she fought back. She was strong. Her husband and two grown sons had to use all their strength to push her down. My mom was a nursing student at the time, so my Lolo forced her to help out. He told her to clean her up while she was bedridden, but when my mom tried to give her a sponge bath, she tried to bite her and then laughed. They tried to call the local priest in to see what he could do to save her soul, but he refused to see her. Priests wouldn't go near her because they didn't study exorcism. They feared that the bad spirit would enter their bodies. All her relatives just prayed around her with rosaries led by my Lola, or grandmother. The prayers helped. Before the bad spirit left her body, my mom said she vomited gallons of blackness. Once the bad spirit left her body, she passed away. Luckily, the bad spirit didn't enter anyone's body afterward. I guess prayers do help. To this day, I am still uncertain about whether or not possessions are real, but I believe my mom. Because of this, I refuse to see a psychic or faith healer. You never know who they are working under, and I don't want to be cursed.
I went to college in a small town and lived in a dormitory freshman year. It was rumored to be haunted, but I didn't believe it at first. It was said the dormitory used to house only female students, and one of the girls who lived there fell in love with a professor, entered a relationship with him, and got pregnant. When the rumor spread, everyone judged and was mean to her. She was also going to be expelled, and the professor would be fired. The professor broke up with her. She felt like she had ruined her life and didn't have support from family or friends. So she went up to the fourth floor of the dormitory and hung herself. Over the years, students would claim the dormitory was haunted and would have their belongings thrown at them out of nowhere if they mocked the ghosts. I didn't believe it could be possible. But during my freshman year, odd things would happen like random cold spots in the building and the elevator opening and closing all on its own, which I saw a few times but blamed on the building being old. Some nights, while studying or trying to go to bed, I would hear furniture being moved around and loud footsteps. I didn't know where it was coming from, but it was pretty loud. I would always wonder why someone would move furniture only at night, usually around midnight. This would happen maybe once or twice a week. Eventually, I was fed up because it was distracting me from studying for my exams. So, I stormed upstairs, which was the guy's section of the dormitory, and knocked on the door of the person who lived directly above me. He answered the door half asleep and confused while I yelled at him to stop making noise and moving furniture around because I was trying to study. He had no idea what I was talking about, and I stormed away. This continued happening, and I eventually just accepted it without much explanation. One night, while hanging out in my ex's room, the guy stopped by and I asked again why he moves furniture around at night. I thought he was weird. He denied it again. So I reported the issue and was told that no one was moving furniture around. Apparently it's something the ghost does some nights, and no one can explain it because it comes from the fourth floor, which has been closed off for decades. I was a bit freaked out and no longer wanted to sleep by myself. Shortly after that, I walked up the staircase that was also rumored to be a place of paranormal activity because it was the quickest way to my ex's room. I felt a sudden breeze and tripped. It felt like something or someone had pushed me and I had a bruise on my knee. I quickly ran up the stairs and tried to go to sleep. That night, there was a storm raging outside. The lights kept flickering and the floors were creaking. I eventually went to bed, and I dreamt of the ghost in the staircase asking for help. She didn't seem angry, but sad and alone. She was just looking at me. When I woke up, I felt uneasy and as if it were real. The rest of the year, I accepted her. When I heard something being moved around or an unusual sound, I just acknowledged that she was there and everything seemed to be okay. I realized that all she wanted and needed was a friend. Years ago, on my morning commute to school, I witnessed something that left me traumatized. That morning, just like any other morning, my alarm woke me up at 6 and after some hair, makeup, and toast, I left by 7. Even though first period wasn't until 8 and my commute only 30 minutes, any New Yorker knows that the trains always deliver the unexpected. I hopped onto the D train, which was always a bit sketchy. Once the train doors opened, I rushed inside. There was a seat calling my name. It was across from a guy who was asleep. His hoodie was covering his face. I sat down and pulled out a book to study for my biology exam. I was halfway through my commute when the train came to a sudden stop. I looked up and saw that the guy sitting across from me slid and was almost off his seat. He was leaning on the woman sitting next to him, so she pushed him away from her and when she did this, he fell to the ground. The train started moving again. The guy was laying on the floor. He was right next to my feet. A few people got up from their seats to check on him as he didn't get up and wasn't moving. One man, while trying not to lose his balance, walked over and leaned down to check on him. He was a nurse. He asked if anyone had a bottle of water. I reached into my book bag and handed him mine. The man poured a little water onto his face to try to wake him up. No response. He then unzipped the guy's heavy jacket to check his breathing. Still nothing. 
Someone pulled the emergency brake and another person walked between the train cars to get to the train conductor. They tried to look for his phone or wallet to find his ID and emergency contact information, but his pockets were empty. I couldn't help but look down at the guy now. I recognized him. We usually rode the train together every morning. The only interaction we've ever had was the occasional eye contact. I used to catch him from the corner of my eye glancing at me. What happened to him? He had a black eye. I felt so bad and sick to my stomach. And then, his eyes suddenly opened and were looking right at me, so lifeless. We finally reached the next stop. I got off the train along with a few other passengers. The paramedics came quickly. They carried his body off of the train and we all watched, hoping that there was a small chance he could be okay. They placed him down and checked his vitals. Nothing. They confirmed that he was dead. I was late for school already, so I called my dad. He told me to calm down and that I could take the day off from school if I wanted. A few days later, I found a short article about the train incident along with the guy's name. I looked him up on Facebook and found his profile. His mom posted on his page saying that he died of a drug overdose. He also got into a fight with a few teenagers the night before and they jumped and mugged him. Afterward, the teenagers placed him inside one of the empty train cars and left. It was past midnight on a weekday, so no one saw. For the rest of the year, my morning commutes weren't the same. I was traumatized. That was the first dead body I saw. I tried to kill myself. Ever since, I can see things that others can't. I know, cliche, right? Believe me, I've rolled my eyes over it plenty of times. The best way to describe them so you understand is by telling you that everyone has one. Some people figure out how to deal with them, and some people don't. I was the last kind of person. I still am. That weight on your shoulders after a long day? The voice in your head telling you things are terrible and they won't get any better? Yeah, that is them. You can call them what you want. Personal demons, shadows. I call mine Toby. Because a scary thing with an unscary name is less scary, right? You're going to want to know what they look like, and I've seen enough to say that they differ. They shape based on how much they are affecting you. Are you a happy person, <laughs> generally speaking? Maybe a colorless wisp, just floating along with you, waiting to be fed the scraps it can get. Are things hard right now? You're struggling, but for the most part you know that you are going to make it and you can still see the bright side? Guess who has a dark shadow with a creature shape clinging to their back? When they're more solid and hanging on your shoulders so they can whisper in your ear, you're really having a tough time. And when they walk along behind you, fully solid and in your shape, mimicking your movements, I'm sorry. I hate to see those. I hate to see people with sad smiles faking their way through the day while the darkness behind them is, I don't know, mocking them <laughs> with its f***ed up mimicry. I wish I could help everyone, but I can only see them. I've tried to talk to their creatures like I do with Toby, but they can't seem to hear me. I mean, you can tell a person that things will get better and not listen to what their creatures are telling them, but you'll get some crazy looks. Now, I don't know exactly what these creatures want or why they manipulate us, but they are feeding off our negativity and honestly, they seem to really enjoy when we are cruel to each other on top of hating <laughs> ourselves. I can't quite figure out what the end game is to make us kill ourselves. Do they get to move on or do they just find someone else to bother? Toby was sure pissed off that I kept on breathing, but he wouldn't tell me why he wants me to die. 
just spouted off some nonsense about how I wasn't supposed to come back. It was my turn. Whatever the hell that meant. And yeah, I know, I know, I should work on myself so Toby gets weaker, but I'd rather be miserable and spite him by not killing myself. I may be depressed, but Toby is trapped, and that's a perk. I guess if anyone does believe me, stop listening to them and try not to be so negative. And they don't seem to like animals. I have four cats and a dog and Toby will go all the way into another room when I have them around me. He doesn't like pleasant things in general and he runs his mouth more when I'm with friends or family. I don't know enough to help anyone get rid of their creature. I mean, hell, even right now, Toby is telling me not to post this. That I'm all wrong and that this won't help anyone. But f him. It can't hurt. Right? This story happened when I was about six years old. I have a pretty big family, and we were all sleeping over at my grandparents' house. It was me, three cousins, one uncle, and three aunties. We all decided to play hide and seek, so we turned off all the lights and only left the TV with the static screen on as our only light source. They paired me and my cousin H, because we were both really young and would have trouble finding people by ourselves. We passed through the living room and walked down the hall that had a room on each side. As we walked to the room on the right, we saw a faint shadow of something crawling under the bed. It was rather scrawny, but looked hunched over so we thought it was our Uncle T. We laughed as we both were holding hands and squatting to look under the bed, while saying, Uncle T, we found you. But it wasn't him. There was this really pale face that you could see through the darkness that had cuts and scars all over it. But the worst thing was how it smelled. It reeked of rotting meat and let out this banshee blood-curdling scream. My cousin and I stumbled backwards and hugged each other while screaming. I don't remember this part, but my aunties and uncle came running into the room and flipped the light switch on to see us huddled in the corner. We weren't crying, just sitting in the corner of the room, hiding our faces into each other's shoulders. It was almost as if our souls left our body and we were stuck like that. They eventually got through to us, and we each took a huge gasp of air. <gasps> Apparently, everyone heard the scream of whatever was in the room with us and they ran past the living room where the TV was flickering uncontrollably. They turned on the lights only to see something quickly crawl out through the door that led to the backyard. I don't remember what happened after I blacked out, but I'll never forget that terrifying scream and that rotting, disgusting stench it gave off. Alice was the most beautiful girl I ever laid eyes on. She had the most amazing personality. She was sweet and kind with confidence that shined brighter than the stars in the night sky. She had the milkiest white skin. Her hair was jet black with emerald green eyes and naturally blood red lips. The day she walked into my life 
I knew we were meant to be together forever. It took me months to work up the courage to say hi to her. Uh, hey there. <laughs> and when she flashed those pearly whites at me, I was hooked. I did everything to make sure she knew how much I loved her. When she was sick, I would watch over her all night to make sure she was alright. I would spend hours just stroking her hair. She loved it. I could tell by the way she smiled in her sleep as I whispered, I love you, in her ear. I made sure she started every week with a smile with a fresh bouquet of flowers sent to where she worked. She was loved, and she loved me back. She didn't have to say it, because I saw it in her eyes. But then, things began to change. She started becoming withdrawn. She stopped leaving the house, wouldn't go to work. She wasn't going to tell me what was wrong. So, I had to find out for myself. It didn't take me long to find out she was getting unwanted calls from a guy claiming to be madly in love with her. He was bombarding her day and night with phone calls, sending her creepy letters saying if he couldn't have her, no one could. I love you. I couldn't bear seeing the fear in her eyes. It was my job to keep Alice safe, and I promised her I would protect her. So I decided to stalk her stalker, and it didn't take me long to find out where he lived. He lived in a dingy apartment in a place known as Skid Row. I watched his movements. I watched as he watched Alice. As I watched him, I became slightly empathic to his plight. He clearly thought he loved her, and as I watched his obsession grow, I knew I needed to strike. I broke into his apartment, knowing he was busy watching Alice. As I looked around his apartment, his obsession was a lot greater than I expected. He had pictures of her all over the place. Her every movement was captured and displayed on his wall like some trophy kill. I hid out of sight as he came home and went to bed, not knowing I was lurking in the shadows. <sighs> Watching Alice must be tiring work, I thought to myself as he passed out on his bed. I crept out from the shadows. I stood over him as his chest heaved in and out. I picked up a pillow and placed it over his head. By the time he knew what was happening, it was already too late. As he struggled for air, he fought hard for his life, but he was no match for me. And before I knew it, his body went limp. It didn't take long for Alice to get her life back on track. She was back to her bubbly, happy self again. Back at work and living life to the fullest. As I watched over her as she slept, I couldn't help but think, did she know how lucky she was that I was keeping her safe? I stroked her hair as I leaned in to whisper in her ear. Soon. The Philippines is home to many mythical creatures. 
Are the stories true? I want to say yes, because my family has encountered some of them. One of the most infamous creatures of the Philippines is called the Manananggal. One day, my great aunt, who was a healer, was walking home from work. She had a third eye and was known to make herbal medicine and take care of the sick in her town. But her specialty was helping women give birth in a village that didn't have access to Western medicine or hospitals. Because she preferred the quiet, recluse life, she lived in a very small suburban area in Iloilo. She was walking home in the middle of the night and enjoying the glow of the full moon. Then suddenly, she heard a strange noise. Coming from up above, but didn't see anything. It was a very loud sound that pierced her ears. She immediately knew what it was, as rumors of missing people had been circulating through the village, especially pregnant women. She didn't want to believe it. The stories her mother and ancestors passed down to her. She knew that it was the Manananggal. She continued her walk as she had faith and knew she would be protected. She also remembered to apply a special oil she concocted herself that would protect her from the Manananggal. As she continued her walk, the strange noise grew fainter until it was only a whisper. She stopped in fear because she knew what that meant. The life-saving fact many people fail to learn. The quieter it is, the closer it is to you. The noise came from inside a small house. Back then, houses were built of bamboo, so one could easily look inside someone's home. She could sense that something was off. So she looked in between the wall made of bamboo. She witnessed something unforgiving. She saw a creature with the face of a woman. It had long black hair, wings, a long tongue, and sharp teeth. But the most shocking part was that its body was split in half. Its upper half was detached from its lower half. She saw the Manananggal, and upon further glance, she saw that it was eating a woman. The creature looked up at her, but was too busy with her meal, so she ignored my great aunt. My great aunt immediately ran away and went straight into town to tell everyone. A group of people stormed into the tiny house, armed with garlic, salt, and the tail of a stingray, because the creature hates garlic and salt, and applying it to the wound where the lower torso separates will kill it. It can also be killed by the whip of a stingray's tail. The group of people were also planning on burning the creature. But the Manananggal was gone. All that remained were the stains of blood. Shortly after, my great aunt moved to a bigger town. She always feared coming across the creature again. So she made sure her home was covered with herbs and that strings of garlic hung on the roof and windows. She always had her special coconut oil with her too, that was full of spices, and would bubble any time a manananga was near her. It's hard to identify them during the day, since they look like ordinary women and cover their wounds. Supposedly, they no longer exist and were all burned off, but you can never be too sure. Let
Phoenix, my best friend and I, were playing outside on the big school hill when this happened. Pew, 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 pew! Choo, choo, choo! We liked sliding down the hill and fighting on top of it, and yeah, we were kinda stupid. One day, we saw a man who looked kinda old pass by our hill. He had dark brown hair, wore a light blue jacket, had a huge bald spot right on the very top of his head, and a few wrinkles on his face. And yeah, Lennox said hi to the guy for some reason. Hello. The man just replied with a hello in a weird and tricky to understand way. The man then walked away. Lennox and I kept playing until the same guy passed our hill again. Lennox said hi again, and the man replied with the same response. But then, he turned around and walked towards a different path. I was creeped out, but Lennox seemed fine. So I told Lennox to go take a peep and see what the man was doing. Lennox walked closer to him and reported back to me. He said that when he looked over at the guy, the man swung his body backwards and looked at Lennox. His hand was waving at him, and with a creepy smile on his face, he once again said, Hello. Lennox and I ran after him quietly and hid. Lennox went to check if he was gone, and after a few minutes, we saw the man again. We decided to start recording this moment as proof for my mom. When I was recording, Lennox said to the man, Hello, oh, uh, where are you going? And the man replied, I'm going home now. Then he took a path nobody ever took. Without hesitation, we followed him. Along the way, we saw light blue flashes right before our very eyes. And it looked like he was Sonic for some reason. Then, he continued down the path. When we followed him, he was gone. So we headed back to the hill. It was getting dark and Lennox grabbed a stick, aimed it at the wall and said, If this man is a serial killer, this stick will break. He flung the stick at a house, and it broke. We ran to Lennox's house and told his mother everything. Then I was left all alone and had to walk to my house in the scary darkness. Thankfully, nothing happened. When I was at Lennox's house, his dad told me that near Farm Foods in Bolton, there was a kidnapper on the loose. We were thinking that that guy was him. Farm Foods was close to our school, so it must have been him. But we don't know to this day. Lennox and I are still searching for him to get evidence. Lennox has his weapon ready. A stick. As far as I can remember, I've always been a girly girl. Growing up, I used to be obsessed with Barbies and collecting stuffed animals. At the age of nine, I went through a phase where all I collected were porcelain dolls. It all started when a relative gifted me with a porcelain doll on my birthday. I don't remember who this relative was, and neither does my mom. The doll had skin white as snow. Curly black, perfectly pin curled hair, brown eyes, and a light beige dress on. Its face was very realistic. I hardly ever took it outside of the box because, honestly, I was also creeped out by it. But I still admired its beauty from afar. I named her Rosemary. I had a weird relationship with this doll. I would love the doll one month and take her outside of her box to play with. The next month, I would despise and be terrified of her. I decided to leave Rosemary on the top of a bookshelf, which was in the living room. I would never want to stay in the living room by myself because her eyes would always follow me around the room. 
Not to mention the light beige dress. I used to imagine that the doll was buried underground with a wedding dress, and that was the reason behind its discoloration. In one instance, I was home alone and watching TV when the living room lights started flickering uncontrollably. I was scared, so I turned off the TV and ran to my room. When I was hiding in my bedroom, I heard the TV turn on by itself, then turn back off. Luckily, my mom came home shortly after. Occasionally, the doll would also go missing, but I assumed my brother was just trying to mess with me. Sometimes, I would find her in my bedroom with all of my other dolls, still inside of her box. I used to suffer from nightmares. I would dream about Rosemary. In these dreams, she would talk to me from the inside of her box and tell me that she wanted to come outside and play with me. Her mouth would never move. She said that she would never hurt me and that she loved me. In one particular <laughs> nightmare, I went to bed after a long day at school. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of rustling. I went to the living room and the box was on the floor and was left open. Rosemary wasn't inside of the box. I looked around and heard singing. It came from the kitchen, and when I peeped inside, Rosemary was near the sink, holding a knife, still singing. I ran to my parents. They followed me into the kitchen. We grabbed a baseball bat and lighter because we were going to break the doll and set it on fire. Rosemary was walking toward the living room to get back inside of the box. My dad got his slipper and threw it at the doll. It fell back and let go of the knife. She was still crying, and I was horrified, but also angry. The doll was throwing a tantrum on the floor, crying hysterically and screaming at me, this time with a demonic voice. Pick me up, you stupid girl! So I grabbed the bat and started smashing her really hard until she shattered into pieces. Afterward, we collected the remnants of the doll and set it on fire. When I woke up from the dream, I was crying. I went into the living room and the box was on the floor, but Rosemary was still inside. Her cheeks were damp. I wanted to throw the doll away, but my mom said that we could donate it. I agreed to send Rosemary away. When we got to Goodwill and opened the donation box, we saw that the doll was shattered. So they just threw her box away. After Rosemary left my house, the nightmare stopped. Shortly after, I stopped playing with dolls. I was also 11 years old. So, it was time for me to stop and grow up. I wish I could stop shaking. My teeth haven't stopped chattering for hours and my toes are starting to turn blue now. A light fog is coming from under the door I'm hiding behind, which means it's out there, waiting for me to succumb. All I can think of is how warm my bed was two hours ago. I remember coming home from work, another miserable day, and taking a blisteringly hot shower. The hotter it is, the easier the grime comes off. After emerging from a steamy bathroom clean and ready for bed, I locked the house up tight and got comfy in my queen mattress. Just as I was ready to start the office, a draft of cold air came down the hall and into my bedroom. Annoyed and lethargic, I reluctantly got out of bed only to find the window at the top of the stairs wide open. Immediately, I slammed the window shut, locked it, and withdrew to the bedroom to get a weapon. Obviously, someone had broken in and was now in the house with me. All right, 
I yelled. You've got 30 seconds to get out of here, or my machete will make you get out. As I said that, I noticed that it still felt like there was cold air circulating through the house. I waited, listening for the sounds of the intruder leaving, then began to search the rooms. Once the second floor had been cleared, I moved to the stairs to check out the ground floor. Approaching the stairs, I saw a pair of frosty footprints leaving down the stairs. Stupid asshole, I mumbled as I followed the trail towards my kitchen. As I drew closer, the draft grew stronger and colder. This is your last chance to get out of here, I exclaimed nervously. I waited for any response, only to receive silence and a chill up my spine. I slowly pushed the door open, only to be hit with a freezing fog that knocked me back and disoriented me. The fall sent the machete sliding to the other end of the hallway. Then, a sound like cracking ice began to move towards me, growing louder and louder. It was slow and heavy, crunching, like heavy boots trekking through virgin frost. To my horror, the kitchen door began to slowly open and pour the icy fog into the hall with me. I jumped up and ran into the coat closet next to me. There was no lock on the inside, so I tied a jacket around the knob to get a better hold on the door. With legs locked against the frame, I prepared to hold on for my life. The crunching came closer and closer as the cold fog began to sneak under the door. When the noise stopped, I braced for the tug of war. But the struggle never came. The being simply stopped and waited on the other side of the door. Now I wait, praying for a miracle, but expecting to soon slip into the freezing darkness that surrounds me.